second talk is by Professor Michael Ramsey Musso on the actual weak phase transitions. Good morning, everyone, and I want to thank the organizers for the invitation to be here uh, to this really interesting meeting and for the opportunity to talk about something that really excites me, which is uh, how electroweak symmetry was broken in the early universe. So let me just start with uh, some basics. What are the, what's the motivation for the subject? There are really two questions that I think we would like to address. The first is, what is the thermal history of electroweak symmetry breaking? And the second is to connect with the baryon asymmetry and to determine whether or not the conditions for weak scale baryogenesis or electroweak baryogenesis existed in the early universe. Now, since uh, this is a kind of broad meeting, I'm going to be a little bit basic and start with uh, what's part of our particle physics iconography. This is something everyone, of course, uh, is familiar with. And we think something like this fixed potential is realized in nature today. The question is, what did it look like in the early universe, and how did that evolve as a function of temperature? So what I'd like to do is take a slice uh, through one axis and ask, what are the possibilities? Uh, over on the left here are a couple of uh, cartoons that illustrate how the effective potential might have evolved in the early universe. On the far left is a first order evolution, where as the temperature cools, the secondary minimum develops, and eventually symmetry is broken at the lower minimum here, and there is a barrier between the unbroken and the broken phase. Uh, on the right is a second order transition where there is no barrier, uh, and one just sort of gently rolls into the broken phase at some temperature. So we'd like to know the electroweak symmetry breaking transition, which of either of these pictures uh, might have applied, and maybe it was neither one. Maybe it was a very smooth, what's called a crossover transition. Now, to connect with the baryon asymmetry, here's how I like to think about it, which is our ways of thinking about the origins of elementary particle masses. Um, so we have, of course, uh, all of the charged elementary fermions that are sort of grouped up here and the neutrinos that are down here. And that is motivating people to think of maybe two different ways of thinking about the origin of mass. Uh, over on the right, uh, we're pretty convinced the Higgs mechanism or something like it is responsible for these masses. And so the electroweak baryogenesis scenario tries to connect this Higgs mechanism to the origin of the baryon asymmetry. Uh, over on the left, uh, this gap suggests that maybe something else is responsible for neutrino masses, and sort of the going uh, very beautiful idea here is that maybe the baryon asymmetry is connected to that something else, uh, particular leptogenesis, which requires the breaking of a different symmetry in the early universe lepton number. So in this talk, I'm going to concentrate on the branch on the right and ask whether or not the conditions for this electroweak baryogenesis mechanism uh, existed in conjunction with the thermal history of electroweak symmetry break. So just to put that in the context of uh, energy scales in the early universe, uh, up at very high energies is where we think standard, standard thermal leptogenesis would have been active. There are, as you know, a large number of baryogenesis scenarios, and uh, so I've listed just a few representative examples here to set the scale. Down here at the weak scale is where the electroweak scenario uh, is located, and that's the one that I'm going to be focusing on uh, in this talk. So our question is, what was the thermal history of electroweak symmetry breaking, and did the conditions for electroweak baryogenesis exist? And uh, in terms of the latter, um, the real criteria that we need to determine whether or not it existed was whether or not there was a first order phase transition that was very strong. And so I'm going to be coming back to that over and over from really three different perspectives. Um, what kinds of models might give us a strong first order electric phase transition? How do we test those ideas? And then how theoretically robust are our computations of that thermal history and the corresponding connection to uh, phenomenology. So the goals for this talk is really to highlight some recent developments in model building and phenomenology. I'd like to illustrate what I think are some of the opportunities for uh, discovering and characterizing uh, the thermal history with the Large Hadron Collider and possibly our next generation colliders. And then discuss at the end of the talk some new insights we're getting from studies of phase transition dynamics in a non-perturbative context. Uh, I won't discuss some very interesting related topics, which are the use of gravitational waves to probe uh, possibility of a phase transition 
And of course, I won't talk about CP violation, which is an important ingredient for actually generating the very asymmetry if there was a first order phase transition. So uh, the outline, I'll give you some broader context, talk about some specific scenarios in the reach, that's the phenomenology and the models, and then I'll come back to this idea of theoretical robustness. So starting with the context, I like to think about this idea of electric symmetry breaking in the context of what we know about QCD. Here's the QCD phase diagram in some cartoon sort of representation. On the vertical axis is the temperature. On the horizontal axis is the baryon chemical potential. This line right here is the line that corresponds to a first order QCD confinement, deconfining phase transition. So if one is at sufficiently large baryon chemical potential, if the universe cooled down at that chemical potential, then there would have been a first order confining transition. What we know from theoretical studies and from measurements at the Rick Collider is that um, we're not in that regime. We're in the regime where the transition of the early universe was a crossover. And now what people are trying to do with the Rick experiments is crank up the baryon chemical potential sufficiently high to see if they can find where this endpoint of the first order phase transition line is. Um, so there's a lot of effort that's gone into this phase diagram study over the last uh, um, 20 to 30 years, really. So we can ask, what's the corresponding phase diagram for the electroweak sector, and uh, did it permit this sort of first order phase transition uh, in some sense? So here's what we know in the standard model. Here's the phase diagram in my sort of cartoon uh, sort of setup. Uh, again, on the vertical axis is the temperature. On the horizontal axis is now not chemical potential, but it's the Higgs mass. Uh, this line here would be the line of a first order phase transition. And it turns out there is a critical value of the Higgs mass above which the transition is a crossover. What we have learned from non-perturbative calculations uh, from a variety of different groups is that that critical Higgs mass is somewhere in the 70 to 80 GeV range. So clearly, in our universe, if all we had was the standard model degrees of freedom at the electroweak scale, then the transition would have been, as in QCD, a crossover transition. So uh, we're, of course, hoping that there might be some other stuff around at the TeV scale, and so one can ask, uh, how would this picture change in the presence of new uh, degrees of freedom at the weak scale and above? And could one get back for 125 GeV Higgs a strong first order electroweak phase transition? So uh, there are uh, three ways that, that I know of that you can get a first order phase transition by adding beyond standard model physics. One is through thermal loops involving new bosonic degrees of freedom. The second is to modify the zero temperature potential through uh, changes in the Coleman-Weinberg potential. And the third is to actually change the tree level vacuum structure of the theory. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on possibilities one and three. Um, and, and if there's time and questions, I can mention some cases where uh, possibility number two also seems to play a role that we've learned. So let's turn to some concrete models and the corresponding phenomenology to see how this works. So there are two sort of approaches we can take. One is to try to work within a UV complete model like supersymmetric uh, realizations. And uh, the other possibility that we've been hearing about in this meeting is to work in simplified models that reflect some of the important features of the UV uh, complete scenarios. Uh, so I'm going to focus on the simplified model possibility just because I think that helps us think more clearly about phase transition uh, dynamics. And then one can always ask later on how do they get embedded in something that's actually uh, likely to be realized in nature. So the particular class of models I'm going to work on are the Higgs portal models. And uh, I find it useful to sort of organize them in terms of the number of degrees of freedom that you add to the standard model, scalar degrees of freedom, and how one would or would not uh, change the phase transition dynamics. So uh, the simplest cases involve adding one, two, or three degrees of freedom. The first three lines in this table involving adding singlets, either real or complex singlets. Uh, once one gets to three degrees of freedom, you can introduce an electroweak multiplet, a so-called real triplet. And in all cases, we'll be focusing on the possibility that they might uh, catalyze a first order phase transition. And in some cases, one can al also get at least some fraction of the relic density of dark matter uh, from these new degrees of freedom. So uh, if you ask me if these are realized in nature, just as, as listed here, I would say, of course, no. Um, this is really, to my mind, the sort of proverbial spherical cow of electroweak phase transition physics. Um, 
but uh, hopefully there's some features of the UV complete models that are reflected in these simplified models uh, that then uh, persist when we talk about the phase transition dynamics. So I'm going to take the simplest one for purposes of uh, this part of the talk, which is the real singlet, and the potential will not have any kind of discrete symmetry that allows for a dark matter candidate. So here is the Higgs portal potential, the renormalizable potential is very simple. There are two operators that connect to the Higgs, one that is uh, a trilinear operator in the scalar fields, S is the real singlet, and one that is called cross-cortic operator. And one can show, and this has been shown by us and others already many years ago, that a couple of things happen when you write down this potential. The first is one can get a strong first order phase transition um, even for 125 GeV Higgs. And the second is, uh, we now have at zero temperature a phenomenology that involves two scalar fields that in general mix to form two Higgs-like states. And uh, just to set the notation, there's some mixing angle of theta, and when theta is zero, H1 is the standard model of Higgs, and H2 is the single-like scalar. So, uh, back to our phase transition picture, then, what the introduction of this very simple model does is it really allows one to extend this line uh, above uh, 125 GeV for the standard model like Higgs. And so, um, so I think that's already quite, uh, quite interesting. So you can ask, how would one then go about testing this very simple idea that again may be reflected in something more UV complete, like uh, next to minimal um, supersymmetric um, standard model sort of incarnation. So, first of all, um, one has to think about the potential a little more um, carefully. Now it's a potential in two field space. There's a singlet direction and a Higgs direction. And so what one has to analyze as a function of the parameters in this very simple model is the thermal history of this energy surface in this two field space. And then you can ask, for the choices of the parameters that give a first order electroweak symmetry breaking transition, um, what are the low energy um, consequences that might be testable? In other words, what is the collider probe? So um, already, I think 12 years ago, um, my uh, collaborators and I, Stefano Profumo and Gabe Shaughnessy, uh, studied this very simple model uh, and did this analysis and then projected the choices of the parameters into a plane of uh, parameters that's really relevant for phenomenology, which is the plane of the two masses, of the two mass eigenstates. So on the vertical axis is the mass of the single-like state, and on the horizontal axis is the mass of the standard model-like Higgs. And at the time we did this study, um, all these black points were allowed uh, phenomenologically and also gave you a strong first-order phase transition. What we know now, of course, is that we live right where this purple line is, 125 GeV uh, is the standard model-like Higgs mass, but there's still uh, an abundant uh, array of choices of the parameters that would give you a strong first order phase transition with a corresponding range in the mass of the singlet like scalar, ranging from very light to something getting up to about 900 um, GDB or so. So, how do you test this possibility just on, under this purple line here? Um, to think about that carefully, we divide this region into three regimes. Uh, above this um, uh, steeply sloped blue line, uh, is where the mass of the singlet-like scalar, if it's produced, could decay, is heavy enough to, to allow decay to two standard model-like Higgses. Below the less steep blue line is where the converse holds, where the standard model-like Higgs could decay to two singlet-like scalars. And in between, there's no, excuse me, no new decay mode that is opening, uh, and so one has to look for other observables to try to probe that region. So what are the observables? So if one is living in this region of very heavy singlet-like mass, then there's a process one can look for at the LHC called resonant dye Higgs production, uh, which provides a very powerful probe here. I'm going to talk about that. Anywhere, uh, it's interesting to think about precision measurements of Higgs properties. And then if one is in the very light singlet region, there would be new decay modes open for the standard model-like Higgs, and so these would be so-called exotic Higgs decays. So let's look a little bit more detail uh, at some of the phenomenology here. Let's start with a resonant dye Higgs production. And here's just a cartoon to illustrate a kind of signature you might look for. So you produce the singlet-like Higgs through gluon fusion or one of the other conventional uh, Higgs production mechanisms. It uh, decays to two standard model-like Higgses that then decay to all combinations of the things that a standard model-like Higgs could decay to. 
like BB bar diphoton, BB bar di tau, 4Bs, and so forth. And so one can ask, and we did, um, how far up in mass of the singlet-like uh, state could one go to try to probe uh, for this possibility if the parameters are chosen in a way to give a strong first-order phase transition? In other words, what does it take to really conclusively test up to the highest masses that are phase transition um, compatible? So here is maybe the most important slide of this talk, actually, which illustrates that. And let me talk you through this a little more slowly. So over on the left, um, uh, what is plotted is the mass of the, sing the singlet-like state on the vertical axis and the mixing angle parameter, cosine of theta, on the horizontal axis. So the further and further you get to one, closer to one, the more and more standard model-like the, the Higgs state H1 is. Uh, Electroweak precision observables constrain one to lie inside this brown region here. And all of these dots correspond to choices of the parameters that give a strong first order phase transition. So uh, one way to look for evidence for this kind of mixing is through precision Higgs measurements. And uh, just to guide your eyes to the sensitivity, um, here are some sensitivities for various incarnations of the International Linear Collider. The red line corresponds to a sensitivity that one thinks might be achievable at the CEPC or FCCEE. And so you can see that many choices of the parameters would lead to uh, observable deviations in precision Higgs measurements. But the resonant di Higgs uh, sensitivity is the one that I want to highlight is over on the right here. And, and so what is plotted is the significance of observation of the resonant di Higgs production process. Uh, that's n sigma on the vertical axis as a function of the singlet-like mass, which is on the horizontal axis. And what we did is we looked at two final states, BB bar, di photon, and 4 tau, um, and asked if you take all the choices of parameters that give you a first order phase transition, there's going to be some minimum di Higgs production cross section, some maximum di Higgs production cross sec section, um, and everything else will lie in between for a given mass. That's the min and the max of these sort of bands here. So as we go up in mass, everything inside the blue wedge um, would correspond to choices of parameters giving a strong first order phase transition. Here's five sigma is the dotted line. And now what are the colors corresponding to? So the blue corresponds to the LHC reach in its high luminosity phase. And so you can see that for relatively light um, singlet-like scalars. Um, there's the possibility to discover this model, um, but as one goes up in mass, then one starts to fall below the five sigma sort of level. On the other hand, if you look at these, so let's take the red region here, corresponds to a 100 TeV PP collider with 30 inverse out of barns of integrated luminosity. And you can see that with this uh, capability, one could uh, probe the entire region. Uh, of uh, parameter space in this model. So what we learned from the study is that there is a possibility that the LHC could discover this really simplest way to get a first order phase transition, but to conclusively probe it in this region of di Higgs production uh, would really take the next generation proton-proton collider. A second approach, as I mentioned, is precision Higgs studies, and one of the very interesting properties is the Higgs self-coupling, and so when you have this model, you have modifications of the Higgs self-coupling from its standard model value. And so uh, several groups have analyzed what this might lead to um, in terms of a collider signature. Let's focus over on the lower left here. Uh, what's plotted on the horizontal axis is the Higgs self-coupling, and on the vertical axis is the critical temperature of a first order phase transition. The dots correspond to all the choices of the model parameters that give a first order phase transition. And what you can see is there's a, a reasonable correlation between the value of the Higgs self-coupling and the critical temperature of a transition. So what do we learn from this? What we learn is that if you want to learn something about the thermodynamics of the Higgs potential in the early universe in this particular model, then the Higgs self-coupling is one diagnostic, or one, one sort of thermometer uh, that one can use. The colored bands correspond to the sensitivities of prospective uh, measurements of the Higgs self-coupling with different colliders. 
Uh, the purple is the sort of estimate of the sensitivity of the Large Hadron Collider at the end of its life. The, um, uh, let's see, what are the different colors here? I've got to go back and look closely myself. Yeah, the um, sort of green here corresponds to the International Linear Collider, and the bright yellow in the middle is a pessimistic view of the sensitivity of a 100 TGD PP collider. So again, uh, depending on one's um, capabilities, uh, there is a strong possibility for of seeing a uh, significant deviation of the Higgs self-coupling uh, from its standard model value, and that might tell you something in this context, what the temperature was during which the transition took place. Let me just go to the last um, bit of where people have been doing some work, which is not down in this very low region here where exotic Higgs decays uh, would occur, but there is another process one can analyze called non-resonant di-Higgs production. And I just want to mention uh, that people have been studying how one could also use the 100 TTV collider uh, to probe this region of parameter space using a di-Higgs production, but there the mediator would not be on shell, and so it would not be a resonant process, and it would take a very uh, high energy, high luminosity um, machine to do that. But there is a, a good discovery potential, it turns out, for the 100 TDB collider. So, um, already I think we see in this very simple model that a strong first order phase transition could exist uh, in a very simple way, um, that it may or may not be discoverable at the Large Hadron Collider, but that in all likelihood a next generation collider program involving some combination of uh, E plus E minus and PP at 100 TeV uh, would be a definitive way to probe it. Uh, the middle two possibilities in this table I'm not going to talk about just because of time and I'm going to put those into the backup slides because I want to get to uh, some of the other topics that I think are interesting and I'm going to turn my attention now to what happens if the new degree of freedom carries electroweak quantum numbers. And, uh, so, so why, yeah, I got to tell you, this 10 minutes is a little, a little loose based on uh, the previous talk, but I'll, I'll stay close. Um, so, electroweak multiplets, the simplest one is one that carries, um, has three degrees of freedom, as they're called a real triplet, and uh, so one can similarly write down a Higgs portal uh, interaction um, using uh, the same kind of setup we did for the real singlet. Um, here, the object that would be responsible for the phase transition is the neutral triplet uh, right here. Um, there are two terms that one can write down as one did for the, the real singlet, um, a, a triple and a, a cross quartic coupling. Uh, and in general, um, with both operators, one can get a first order phase transition, but a very interesting possibility is if one imposes a, a stabilizing symmetry to uh, uh, to this potential, then the neutral component of the triplet can contribute to the dark matter. So I'm going to concentrate on that possibility in the remainder of the time that I have. So one of the interesting things that one learns when you have an additional degree of freedom that carries electric quantum numbers is that uh, if it gets a vacuum expectation value in the early universe, that can break electroweak symmetry, maybe at a different temperature than the Higgs uh, phase in which we live. And so one encounters the possibility that there might be multiple steps of electroweak symmetry breaking. Um, and so the idea is represented over here on this plot on the upper right. This is the free energy as a function now of the neutral component of the Higgs and the neutral component of the triplet. Um, in our sort of simplest thinking, the electroweak symmetry breaking transition to the Higgs phase occurs in one step, and that might be true. But it's equally possible that perhaps first one breaks electric symmetry by going to what's called the triplet phase, and then at a lower temperature makes the transition to the Higgs phase. And if you want to think about that in terms of pictures, here's how the potential might look for some choices of the parameters in the Higgs portal. Um, so here are the two axes. Um, and so the first step in this two-step scenario might go here to the triplet phase and sit in the, that minimum for a little while and eventually, the Higgs phase minimum drops below it in temperature, and then one makes a second transition to the Higgs phase here. Um, so nothing precludes this from happening. In fact, it's, it's a pretty generic possibility. So why is that interesting for baryogenesis? Why it's interesting for baryogenesis is um, illustrated by taking this picture here and looking at it sort of from the top down. So here's the origin. Um, this vertical axis is the triplet axis, the horizontal axis is the Higgs axis, and the idea now for baryogenesis is that 
one might actually make the baryon asymmetry during the first step by going to the triplet phase. And so now we live in an early universe phase that has a baryon asymmetry that's not our phase. And then during the second transition, that baryon asymmetry is, is handed off to the Higgs phase. And it turns out this opens up a lot more freedom for doing electroweak baryogenesis than if one is doing a direct transition to the Higgs phase here. So uh, this is kind of a new idea that's uh, emerged in the last few years and uh, sometimes called exotic electric symmetry breaking, but it's really something that, that occurs, we know, in condensed matter systems, which is breaking the symmetry in multiple steps. Might happen. So how might you probe this experimentally? Um, well, uh, first is to plot the region of parameter space that's relevant for uh, this two-step uh, transition to occur. So here's the generic Higgs portal operator. There's a Higgs portal coupling, and there's a, a mass of the triplet. On the vertical axis is the triplet mass. On the horizontal axis is the triplet coupling, the portal coupling, rather. And this sort of hashed region here is the region that would be favorable to getting this two-step uh, two transition history to occur. Now to probe it, um, what makes the electroweak multiplet interesting is that when you couple the multiplet to the Higgs, then through loops, there's a new contribution to the Higgs to diphoton decay. And the strength of that effect depends on the same parameters that govern the phase transition history, the Higgs portal coupling and the mass of the triplet. And so it turns out there are lines in this plot that you probably can't see that correspond to uh, relative shifts in the Higgs diphoton rate compared to the standard model, and in the region where the two-step transition would occur, the uh, Higgs diphoton rate would be smaller than it is in the standard model. Uh, and so, uh, looking again to future precision measurements of Higgs properties, um, you know, with a combination of, say, a circular E plus E minus collider and a future PP collider, one can get to a sub percent level determinations of the Higgs diphoton branching ratio, which certainly would provide a definitive probe of this possibility here. Okay. So I think there are a lot of interesting um, possibilities for very simply extending the standard model and changing the sort of thermal history of electroweak symmetry breaking, not only to get a first order phase transition, but maybe to do it more than once in the early universe and a rich array of possible collider probes to, uh, to, uh, to test the ideas. So in the last uh, few minutes, let me just say something about this um, question of how well we actually calculate the properties of phase transitions in the early universe that then underlie the phenomenology that I've discussed. So uh, there are two approaches. Uh, one is a non-perturbative calculation of phase transition dynamics, and that's the most reliable, theoretically. Um, but that's very hard to do model building and phenomenology with because if you want to survey a lot of different models and a lot of different parameter points, then to do Monte Carlo calculations over a wide range of, of uh, those choices is, um, is quite expensive. On the other hand, there's perturbation theory, which is what everyone in phenomenology uses, um, but it's not necessarily so quantitatively reliable. So what we would like to do is to determine the degree to which the perturbative calculations um, have anything to do with reality. And so the program that we are working on is, is what I call benchmarking perturbation theory, which is to use non-perturbative studies to determine how well the perturbation theory studies are actually reflecting uh, the, the real phase transition dynamics. Now, why might you worry about perturbation theory? Why you might worry is that in finite temperature calculations, there's an effective gauge coupling parameter called G-effective that depends on a ratio of the square of a three-dimensional gauge coupling and a thermal mass. And it turns out, for example, in the standard model, when you get close to that endpoint for a first-order phase transition, this G effective is not so small. It starts to get large. And so you might worry just how well your perturbative expansion is, uh, is converging. And so this really points to the need uh, for doing a, a real non-perturbative study. So how do we proceed to do that? Um, so, the way to, to do that is, uh, at least we've been pursuing, is to use what's called the three-dimensional high T effective theory. And let me, let me finish by talking about that idea. So, in any talk about an effective theory, you have to start with a vertical axis, which is the mass scale or the energy scale. And so we're going to start uh, with a full theory that's relevant up at some high energy scale. 
And this full theory includes the beyond standard model scalars that I've been talking about that might give a first order phase transition. Uh, one can then derive through a well-defined procedure called dimensional reduction, a low energy effective theory that involves only the Higgs boson and the massless uh, gauge bosons. And what's nice about that is that in the past, people have done lattice simulations of phase dynamics, phase transition dynamics in this effective field theory. And so the program that we are pursuing is to do the following, is to assume that the heavy, the beyond the standard model scalars are heavy or super heavy and integrate them out, um, leading to the effective theory for which existing lattice calculations have already been done. We can use those to determine the values of these parameters in the effective theory that give us a first order phase transition. And then through a process, a well-defined process of matching, the full theory onto the effective theory, determine what are the choices, the parameters of the effective theory that would give us um, a first order phase transition. And I want to end by illustrating that in the case of this real trigger model. So here's uh, some results from a recent uh, work that we did with the group in Finland, as well as uh, my former postdoc, Karen Patel. Um, and what's plotted here is the following. On the vertical axis is the Higgs portal coupling, and on the horizontal axis is the triplet mass. Um, the gray region was not accessible to us for this uh, effective theory approach, but the colored region is. And in the colored region, the blue corresponds to choices of these parameters that give a crossover transition. Now, why is that instructive? That's instructive because perturbation theory could never tell us we were in a crossover domain. We only see that from Monte Carlo. The light green region corresponds to a first order phase transition, and the dark green is a region where the effective theory starts to break down. So we're not gonna trust things up here. But it's very interesting that you can see as a function of the coupling and the mass, one has a boundary between a first order transition and a crossover transition. And that is not something we would get from perturbation theory. So I think this tells us very importantly that Going forward, one really has to use non-perturbative studies to really fully analyze the phase transition dynamics in the early universe. Well, let's think a little bit about the phenomenology. Um, these dashed lines correspond to lines of constant shifts in the Higgs diphoton decay rate, as I mentioned before. So for example, right here, this is a, uh, an 8% reduction from the standard model expectation. And so you might imagine doing the following. Suppose through other... Uh, methods, you determine the mass of the triplet, and there are ways to do that. Um, you might learn, for example, that you live at, say, 250 GdB, and then you measure a deviation of the Higgs diphoton decay rate to be 10%. That would tell you the Higgs portal coupling, and that would tell you you live right here inside the first order phase transition region. But if you had a smaller deviation of the Higgs di diphoton decay rate, then you would learn that you live in a crossover region. So a combination of these measurements with this non-perturbative analysis, I think really tells us something potentially very interesting uh, about what, uh, what might have actually been the dynamics in the early universe. So let me come to my conclusions then. Um, so, you know, if anything, I hope you'll take away from this talk that uncovering the thermal history of electric symmetry breaking is, I think, a really exciting challenge for particle physics, and that exploring that history involves a really rich array of physics, from model building, phenomenology, these theoretical uh, developments that I just illustrated, and of course the experimental probes. Um, I think there are really interesting possibilities to discover um, the phase transition dynamics um, at the LHC and possibly future colliders, and, and probably definitively probing this physics will take the next generation proton-proton collider and finally, I, I want to encourage people to maybe get involved in this, uh, in this kind of research because I think there's ample opportunities to make, uh, to make important contributions. Thanks very much. Question? Michael, one thing you would hope to get maybe from this is that you get some sort of um, some, some lower bound on how decoupled the extra physics can be so that you just have a first order phase transition, right? Right. I didn't quite get that from, like, when you talked about the real singlet case. Right. Should it be that some of the dots can't extend to cosine theta equals 1, can they? No, they don't.
are some, then you, then you go to essentially a Z2 symmetric theory, because you have no mixing. And there are ways to get a first order phase transition in that case. It's just not through um, the same physics that gives you mixing between the two singlets. I did, I did this model illustration, I didn't, I didn't give you the Z2 symmetric limit. But there, there is the possibility to get a first order phase transition and a Z2 symmetric limit. And we saw both from perturbation theory and from some, some of the same sort of recasting of the lattice studies uh, that you can do that. So, so it is possible in that decoupling limit. We also learned that there's sort of a maximum mass for the new scalar. Uh, that's of order a TDV or a little bit less. Um, and so, th so there is a way to sort of probe that sort of boundary of, uh, uh, of, of getting this first order phase transition. How, uh, the other limit which I don't think we talked about where you have light or extra singlets, um, is there sort of a, you know, um, a maximal decoupling you could have of that light state? Or? So that's a really good question and, and I don't have it to show you here. We have a work in progress uh, that explores that in the real singlet case. You know, there is a, a sort of a minimum that you would expect um, to reach in terms of the Higgs portal coupling and the mass. And so there is a kind of a, uh, you know, a target in that direction. Yeah. But I don't, I don't have, it's, it's a work in progress, so I don't have the, the results to show you here. But, but, but the question is absolutely a good one. I mean, I guess to say that that would be very interesting to a whole community of people looking for these low energy dark cases, right? Because we have this parameter space with no real targets. You can tell us, you know, very good and give you a target that would be right. very, very useful. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, thanks for the question. So far. Can you make a comment on the gauge dependence issue? The gauge dependence issue. I'm glad you asked. Uh, so, um, you know, the calculations that I showed um, were done using a setup that ensures that the uh, determination of the parameters of the phase transition don't depend on the gauge parameter. But the sort of naive choice that people have been using for decades, uh, which is just to calculate the full Coleman Weinberg finite temperature effective potential and look for the value of the temperature at which its minimum at, away from the origin is degenerate with the origin. That introduces a gauge dependence uh, into the, what should be a gauge independent um, sort of uh, figure of merit for the first order phase transition. So um, one has to be careful, and that goes in that list of sort of theoretical robustness um, that you know, I didn't bring any slides to, to talk about it, but it is a, it's an important consideration. 